Well, Labor's right to disconnect laws haven't been too popular with employers or the coalition. The opposition leader, Peter Dutton, has even gone so far as to say he'll repeal the legislation if he wins the next election. But setting aside this political division, what are voters saying about this? Joining me now is Red Bridge Group Director Simon Welsh. Simon, you've been doing a little bit of group research on this this week. What's the feedback? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's 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 a debate that's sort of been framed, and I've seen in sort of some parts of the media sort of talking about it as being, you know, it's a right to disconnect for those young millennial workers that you know don't want to work so hard and all the rest of it. <laughs> that actually really misses the political significance of what we're seeing here. So, yeah, a absolutely, there is strong support for for this kind of policy amongst younger workers. But there's a common thread that ties them to a larger body of older workers, particularly those in positions in roles in industries that, that have been made a bit more precarious. They, they feel quite insecure in mm. their work. They feel quite powerless in their work environment. And, and these workers feel like they, they can't stand up, they can't speak up. And they talk to us about, you know, these experiences that, you know, they're trying to sit at home with family and, and friends and, and the phone goes off and it ruins the evening. You know, they feel like they're making big sacrifices for their job already. And this is just another burden, that another intrusion yeah, okay. into their life outside. So what kind so of industries are we talking about, Simon? Because I don't think there's been a good example given by the Greens or Labourers to who's really affected by this. Yeah. So, so it's particularly those industries that have been uh, sort of casualised, a lot of contract work. So, okay. so think, think you're sort of retail hospitalities, think your, your caring professions, you know, early childcare workers, aged care, those yeah. sorts of things. Highly feminised industry, so, okay. so it is an issue that speaks particularly to women. And, and so I think th this is where that, I think the political story here has, and, and significance has been missed, is that there are millions of these people mm. in our outer suburbs. And what are their now, bosses the calling them about after hours? Is it onerous? Does it really add as much stress as the Greens are saying? Certainly the people in our, in our focus groups that are talking to us about this saying, yeah, it does. It does cause a significant stress, e even if it's just having something nagging away at the bottom of your mind that, you know, the boss has contacted you after hours saying, tomorrow I want you to get on this when you, when you come in. We need to work on this. We need to work on that. You're thinking about it. You're thinking it's, it's an intrusion into to that um, dis the disconnection that you'd like to be able to spend on your family and focus on your family's time. So it's, but it's, it's part of a broader sense of, of disempowerment in, in the workplace. You know, part of a broader sense that, you know, whether it's my wages aren't going anywhere, you know, yeah. whether it's my, my if, if I'm on sort of contract casual work, you know, my, my sense of security that the job's going to be there tomorrow, that my hours are going to be there next week. It's all part of this deeper sense of vulnerability. Uh, mm. And it's, it's an important part of it, but, but it's just part of this deeper sense of vulnerability. Right. That's fascinating. So from your assessment and seeing the reaction from these focus groups this week, is this a vote changing issue or is it just a vote framing issue? I, I think that's really interesting. I think certainly what it's doing, I think if, if we look at it in the in the immediate term, I think what's happened is is an issue like this coupled with stage three tax cuts in those outer suburban areas that the mm. Liberals were going after is it certainly halted their momentum. And we're starting to see this in our polling now. The numbers for Labor are sort of stabilising. Whether they're starting to recover or not, is, I think is a different question. I think there's probably more water to go under the bridge and Labor will still need to do more to, to, to sort of gain back some of that ground that's lost. But it certainly stabilised that, that vote. And what it gives Labor is it gives them a defensive line. So going into the next election, if the Libs stick on this on their position on this particular issue that, that they've already stated, mm. people are far more sensitive to perceived losses than they are to perceived gains. Yes. So it gives Labor a defensive line to be able to say, if these guys are elected, they're going to take away your right to disconnect. They're going to give your boss back the right to discipline or, or sack you. They, they will talk about sacking you. Right. So that's why um, negative not... campaigns work. That's correct. That's correct. We are far more attuned to losing things 
than we are to gaining things. And, you know, there's a bit of a healthy Aussie scepticism in that, you know, when a politician <laughs> promises to give us something, yeah. we don't believe it as much as when they promise to take something away from well, us. Well, a good reminder, uh, right, just with the stage three tax cuts, well, you know, until circumstances change. Uh, um, I should just quickly ask about Negative Geary. Have you asked the, any of the groups about this? Yeah, we've done a fair bit on there over, over years um, and, and some recent polling data around that. It, it'd be a brave minister, it'd be a brave prime minister that would take on negative gearing. Why do you uh, say there that? Is still, there is still a, a, a fairly broad base of support for it. It is one area where, um, yeah, yeah, despite some of these sort of class based, if I can use that word, kind of tensions that we're seeing and, and um, you know, the ability to, to exploit that through things like right to disconnect. Negative gearing seems to be this stubborn area of public opinion where there's sort of like people feel uncomfortable, again, loss aversion, people feel uncomfortable about those sorts of things being taken away. And, and even amongst renters, you still see aversion to it because the logic is anything that makes life more difficult for my landlord ends up making life more difficult for me. So the, the, the politics on that aren't clear cut uh, and as I say, there's sort of this um, this sort of sense of, of favourability to, to negative gearing that, that wow. seems to persist that surprises despite me, actually. to the contrary. So essentially, if yeah. any government was going to do anything about negative gearing, it would have to be part of a, a package, a, a quid pro quo, if you like. Yeah, look, if, if I if I were advising them, I'd say make it part of a reform package that comes after the election, you know, save, <laughs> save it for your second term, sort of year and a half in kind of thing, because it's it, mm. it's not an electoral winner, uh, certainly in the same way that, uh, you know, giving people tax cuts and certainly in the same way of being able to paint your opposition in a particular box like right to, like to disconnect has given Labor an opportunity. Fascinating as always, Simon. Good to see you. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Laura.